Okay, well, welcome everyone. My name is Jennifer Boyko. For those of you who uh, haven't attended a webinar before, I'm the manager of scientific operations with the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, or CLSA for short. Thanks for joining us today for the webinar that's entitled The Impact of Urban Greenness on Aging, Physical and Mental Health Among CLSA Participants. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the CLSA National Coordinating Center and McMaster University are located on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations and within the lands protected by the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Queen's University is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territories. The Ontario Tech University acknowledges the lands and people of the Mississaugas and Scugas Island First Nation, a branch of the Greater Anishinaabe uh, Nation. To acknowledge this traditional territory is to recognize its longer history, one predating the establishment of the earliest European colonies. It is also to acknowledge this territory's significance for the Indigenous peoples who lived and continue to live up upon it. As attendees of this webinar today, I do encourage you to continue your learning following the webinar and to acknowledge the original inhabitants of the lands where we currently have the privilege to research, live and work wherever that may be for you. Um, we'll now move to an introduction um, with some standard housekeeping points for today. Everyone but the presenters will be muted throughout the webinar. Uh, if you need to change or test your audio during the webinar at all, you can click audio settings, and this is in the left of the bottom toolbar. Today's webinar will consist of two presentations, so you get a two-for-one deal today. At the end of both presentations, there will be a, a question and answer session. If you have a question about the webinar, um, then at any time, well, you can post the question by typing it into the Q&A box that's located in the bottom toolbar. The questions will be addressed at the very end of the webinar. Uh, questions will be visible to all attendees. If you have any technical trouble concerning the webinar, you can use the chat box to communicate with our webinar team. So again, Q&A box for the uh, questions to the presenters and chat box uh, for technical issues, please. Um, a feedback survey will be launched at the end of the webinar, and we invite you to complete, complete this after exiting your Zoom session today. Uh, the brief, this brief evaluation survey provides us with important feedback that we can use to plan future CLSA webinars. Now on to the webinar. Again, the title is The Impact of Urban Greenness on Aging, Physical and Mental Health Among CLSA Participants. This webinar will be presented by Ermina Klichnik and Susanna Abraham Potagiri. Uh, Ermina is a third-year PhD candidate in health science. She's working under the supervision of Dr. Shilpa Dobra. Her dissertation focus is on the topic of active living, and that's def as defined as the intersection between social participation and movement behavior. Ermina has published two papers utilizing data from the CLSA, and she is especially interested in exploring the role of neighborhood factors as they relate to active living, active aging. Uh, Susanna is a second year PhD candidate in epidemiology at Queen's University in Kingston. For her thesis, she is looking at cancer incidents in the vicinity of Canadian nuclear power plants using the Canadian Census of Health and Environment cohorts. Uh, her supervisors are Dr. Paul Villeneuve from Carleton University and Dr. Will King from Queen's University. Now I will pass it on to Ermina, who will be presenting first today. Okay, can you see that? <laughs> Is that visible? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so thank you. And first of all, thank you for um, inviting me to this webinar series. I've attended a few myself and I've enjoyed um, learning from these. So I'm really happy to have an opportunity to present uh, some of our work that we've done with uh, the CLSA. So, um, and again, thank you for that introduction as well. So today I'll be talking about um, greenness and health among CL uh, CLSA participants. And I'll be highlighting a couple of the studies that we've done using this data, as well as one that's currently uh, under review for publication as well. The 
is it there we go um so i'll thank you also for the land acknowledgement i just wanted to also include that um this area where we're at in oshawa is covered under the williams treaties uh, as well that's uh an important part for us um so greenness is essentially an indicator of quantity of green vegetation uh, on the ground, which is derived from satellite imagery, kind of like you see in this uh, image. Um, it's used when examining relationships between environment and health. Um, and to access the environmental variables from the CLSA, uh, we actually use the pre-linked data set that includes um, like a variety of environmental data from the canoe. Uh, data set, which is the Canadian Urban Environment Health Consortium. So before I go into some of my studies, I just want to give you a few examples of how uh, greenness has been used um, in previous research and a little bit about how it's measured. So um, as I said, it's an image, like a satellite image of how much greenness reflects back into the image uh, from the ground. And so usually within um, a certain postal code or um, a geographic area, we would look at a buffer, like a circular buffer, for example, uh, 250, 500 meters or a thousand meters uh, buffer. Um, so it's been studied for a lot of kind of traditional health outcomes like mortality and, and physical outcomes. Um, the first study that I want to highlight is this one from 2017, which um, looked at the like association between greenness and mortality risk. So on the left there, you can see a hazard ratio going from one to zero. Um, and across the bottom, we've got greenness within a 250 meter buffer. So kind of a smaller area, but essentially you can see that as greenness increases, um, <clears throat> sorry, the risk, uh, the, the, the risk of mortality um, decreases uh, quite a bit as, as that increases. So um, this was in this study, the um, kind of biggest effects were for respiratory disease um, and the lowest for cerebrovascular disease. So there is quite a bit of range, but we're seeing this pattern on a very large scale because the, this study um, actually used participants from the Canadian Census Health and Environment Cohort, which is over 1.2 million participants. So if we're seeing something like this on such a large scale, we know there's, there's something going on in there. Um, this next study by Tuig, Bennett, and Jones, um, they included 103 observational studies and 40 interventional studies, and they looked at over 100 health outcomes. So for this um, collection here, this is six studies that they included in this uh, meta-analysis, and they found that um, higher greenness is associated with a decreased incidence of type 2 diabetes um, across these studies. And they also found that higher greenness is associated with uh, decreased blood pressure across 12 studies. So that is um, pretty, that's that's something, it's not it's not nothing and there's, there's something definitely there. So it definitely um, requires further investigation. And then um, in this study here by Perino et al in 2019, um, this image here is right from their paper. They used uh, greenness, um, they broke it up into tertiles, whereas in the CLSA, we usually use quartiles or quintiles to separate out the data. Um, in the top, the lowest tertile, you can see there's hardly any greenness in there. It's like a um, very cement urban type of neighborhood. Um, and then in the highest, you can see a lot more greenness. And, and it is, like I say, it's a, it's a snapshot of this uh, small buffer area. But um, just to give you an idea of what the satellite images are looking at. So after adjusting for comorbidities, um, in the sample, there was a relationship between greenness and the odds of, um, I'm sorry, the likelihood of depression. So the, um, there was a lower likelihood of depression um, in the medium versus the low uh, greenness, which is actually called NDVI here. It's the normalized difference vegetation index. It's, it's the technical term for it. Um, and then a 12% or sorry, 16% um, lower likelihood um, in the higher uh, greenness versus the lowest. So um, people who are living in these areas, they're experiencing better mental health. So the, this kind of leads us to the question of, um, you know, we're, we're, we're coming to, sh to show um, evidence that greenness results in health, but, but how exactly does this happen? Um, you know, is it enough to 
plant a few trees in your yard and all of a sudden your diabetes disappears? Probably not. Um, so in our lab, we're kind of interested more in these mediating factors or these kind of intermediaries um, such as movement behavior. So um, one area of focus in the study for of older adults is uh, age-friendly environments. So creating communities that are um, that are supportive of uh, social activity, physical activity, um, and which provide access to like healthcare, transportation, and, and other services. Um, and so two important aspects of age-friendly environments are the built environment. So, you know, whether we have sidewalks and parks and, and libraries nearby where people can, and can gather, um, as well as the natural environment. So, um, I mean, you could argue that, you know, building a park or putting a park in could be a part of built environment, but usually these um, kind of more natural environments are considered as, as, as uh, greenness. So um, this one other study that I just wanna highlight because it kind of shows this relationship really well. Um, greenness exposure um, contributes to all these in the, in the middle column, um, all these outcomes like stress reduction, um, air pollution, filtration, regulation of uh, heat and humidity. These are kind of like the obvious measurable things. Um, but right there highlighted is increased physical activity. So we've seen that quite a bit, and I'll talk a little bit about that when I get into our papers. But essentially, um, you know, we like we, we see this connection, but I want you to look to the right of that and see how many connections we have between um, greenness exposure, physical activity, and then all of these health outcomes. So it's like the role of physical activity or movement behavior. Um, definitely needs to be considered when we're when we're looking at uh, greenness and health. The other thing that some of these studies don't really show is, um, let me just, it's not clicking for me, there we go, um, our geriatric syndrome. So this image is adapted from actually another webinar presentation by uh, one of my committee members, Dr. Copeland. Um, so she's kind of outlined geriatric syndromes as these, um, these other syndromes that impact quality of life and independence. So things like pain, frailty, um, falls and things like that. Um, they impact our functional limitations and are kind of stronger um, predictors of self-rated health and mortality than chronic disease actually is sometimes. Um, because as you know, and maybe, maybe you felt this way too, you might be diagnosed with a chronic condition, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have poor self-rated health outcomes. You know, you might have arthritis, but you still do what you want when you want every day. So it might not impact you the same. So these syndromes are kind of more of a, um, coming at it from a self-rated type of, um, you know, your own experience of the actual condition rather than yes or no, do you have a condition? So that leads me to our uh, three papers. So the purpose of our first paper was to look at uh, movement behavior. So we discuss that as uh, physical uh, activity and sedentary time across different neighborhood environments. So I'm going to get into the variables a little bit later, but um, we started with this one to kind of establish that connection with uh, using the CLA, CLSA data because we have all this wonderful environmental data here and it's a beautiful large sample. So we wanted to take advantage of that to see, um, you know, where we can build this story. This, the purpose of our second study was to look at the same uh, neighborhood factors. So um, again, greenness, uh, I'll also mention walkability a little bit, but since um, the focus of this talk is, is more on greenness, I'll, I'll focus more on that. Um, so we looked at the associations between those factors and self-rated measures of health. So like general health, uh, self-rated mental health and self-rated healthy aging, as well as chronic condition count. So the actual yes or no of whether um, you've been diagnosed with something in the last uh, 12 months or ever. And then for our third paper, which is hopefully going to be uh, approved for publication very shortly as we've just finished our revision. Um, the purpose of this study was to assess uh, for a moderating effect between each of physical activity and neighborhood factors and geriatric relevant health outcomes. So for us uh, from the CLSA data, we were looking at um, a physical impairment, uh, pain, medication use, and depression as these um, geriatric relevant health outcomes. Okay. So um, 
overall, the first study differs a little bit from the next two because in the first one we included the entire sample. Um, so we had about 36,000 participants uh, in, in that first study, um, but we, we excluded participants who didn't have complete data for our outcomes. So we got a little bit wiser in study two and three and decided to use uh, multiple imputations to counter that a little bit because we were only using participants 65 and older uh, at baseline for the next two studies. All of our environmental exposures were from baseline um, because the canoe data set is only linked uh, with the baseline data set for CLSA. And total physical, physical activity ranged quite a bit from five to eight hours per week across the different studies, um, just depending on the age and things like that. And just to kind of, just a little bit finer detail into some of our variables. Um, for our first study, we looked at total physical activity. So we use the PACE scale, the physical activity scale for the elderly. Um, it's a self-rated um, instrument. So essentially, um, people are asked, how many days did you participate in light intensity physical activity in the past week and how many hours per day? So we use that information to figure out essentially hours per week and minutes. And then um, we developed a semi-continuous, I guess it was more of a count scale. Um, and then for sedentary time, which was continuous also, we just had the one question about how many, um, how much time do you spend in sitting activities per week? So again, it's, um, we know from the research that that is not the best way to get at um, sedentary time because sometimes we underreport how much we sit or we don't know if something is sitting and something is not sitting, um, or sometimes we over-report. We think we're just sitting the whole time, but really we are getting up and moving it around. So just keep that little caveat in mind as we go through. Um, for, uh, for study two, um, we looked at, for the chronic conditions count, it was just, uh, it was based on the Diedrich framework, which has 10 um, um, kind of like most common chronic conditions for people over the age of 65. Um, and the questions in the CLSA were, have you been diagnosed with one of these um, in the last 12 months and yes or no? Um, and then for self-rated uh, health, we had the general health, mental health and healthy aging, which was kind of rated from um, excellent to poor. And then for our third study, um, our geriatric relevant health outcomes, um, the physical impairment outcome was from the um, Older Americans Resources and Services um, scale. So it was just, it was, um, asking people if they have like one or two or three or more or none um, impairments that kind of prevent them from um, being independent throughout the day, uh, a pain severity rating, um, medication use, which was um, listed as one, two or three plus uh, prescription medication. And then we used um, the uh, depression question using the CSD uh, depression scale. So for our exposure variables, um, again, these are from baseline because that is where um, our environmental data is available. Um, the first one was the ALE. So the ALE stands for the Active Living Environments. Um, we use index or a Z score, uh, depending on the study, but essentially it looks like dwelling density, intersection density, and points of interest within um, your neighborhood, essentially. So we use this as a measure of walkability. Um, you can just put that at the back of your mind because we won't be talking much about it, but I just want you to um, kind of consider it. And then uh, for greenness, the normalized difference vegetation index, again, the NDVI, um, we looked at these values as quartiles because for the, the main purpose is that uh, it's, it's really difficult and I don't want to say meaningless, but it is not as meaningful to, uh, you know, to interpret 0.49 greenness versus 0.45 greenness. So when we look at it in quartiles, it's, um, it's a bit more um, conducive to interpretation. For our first study, we actually used the max of the annual mean um, at a thousand meters because uh, we wanted to use a larger buffer and this is more of a conservative method, um, but we changed it to the mean of the annual mean for the uh, second and third studies because uh, the distribution was a lot better after we were able to impute some of the missing data. So um, a few of the results from our study. Um, this is from study one. Um, 
th this uh, graph just shows the odd ratios for greenness. So these are compared with the first quartile of greenness. So um, in this, you see my mouse there, the first section here, this is the second quartile of greenness compared to the first. So um, when you think about those numbers, we have access to zero to one, uh, a range of zero to one for greenness. Zero indicates barren land. We don't have many people living in barren land in Canada. Um, and then the highest values we had um, was around 0.74, our kind of denser bush type of area or more rural areas. Um, so as greenness goes up, um, we're seeing increases in um, physical activity as well for especially the younger males and females and the males that are kind of middle aged 65 to 74. So um, it's almost like it's going up a little bit here from second to third and then in the fourth it levels up a little bit. These areas are quite rural. So um, the built environment in this area would be a lot lower. And so that's why we considered uh, built environment in this study as well. And then for that, um, for the sedentary time, um, higher levels of greenness also had higher levels of sedentary time for, for the younger males and females. So those age 65 or younger. Um, so that was kind of interesting for us, <laughs> um, surprising result. And then for study two, which was looking at the um, chronic condition count and the self-rated health outcomes, where we saw that there was an increase uh, well, this, this looks like a decrease, but that's because uh, excellent is one and poor is five. Um, there's just 10% higher odds of higher self-rated general health um, and 12% uh, higher odds of better self-rated mental health for higher levels of greenness. Um, so we're seeing this for um, the self-rated variables, but not so much the um, actual chronic condition count. And then for our third study, which uh, hopefully will be out soon enough and you all can read and enjoy that, um, we were looking at um, moderation effects here. So there's an additional effect on top of those known associations that we already are aware of between physical activity and geriatric outcomes and the uh, greenness or neighborhood environment and the geriatric outcomes. So we know there's an association between those th two things, but there is an additive effect when you consider both of those things together. So um, overall, kind of our overall conclusions in study one, we were able to show that movement behavior is different across different neighborhood environments. So it's definitely something that needs to be considered. Oh. Um, and then for study two, neighborhood factors are associated with general health and mental health, uh, self-rated, but not um, chronic condition count. And then for our third study, um, there is a moderating effect between in the relationship between each of uh, physical activity, neighborhood factors, and those geriatric uh, relevant health outcomes. So um, the associations between these outcomes and our um, exposure variable are affected beyond just the individual relationship. So overall, um, the positive association between neighborhood greenness and self-rated measures of health could be due to a lot of factors. Um, but what we are kind of showing with all of this data and all of this, all these findings is that uh, greenness might be an important factor to consider when promoting healthy aging in older adults. So um, the next step is to consider um, other mechanisms by which this is happening. So uh, for me, for my uh, PhD, I'll be looking at the um, an, another mechanism as uh, social interaction and social engagement um, and considering that active aging. So um, I've defined active aging as physical activity and social participation because we know those things are related. Um, so I'll be looking at how environmental exposure like greenness, uh, walkability, other neighborhood factors um, kind of go through this funnel of active aging to uh, result in some measurable health outcomes. And that is it for me. <laughs> Great. Hey, well, thank you very much. That was uh, very informative and I think a, a great first half to our, our webinar today. Um, I just I had sent you a message, Ramina, but maybe if, oh. you, could, if you wanted to uh, type any responses to the questions, if you're able. Um, okay. And, uh, in the Q&A? 
Yeah, I'm just actually thinking that we may end up with a lot of questions, and so it might okay. just uh, save uh, being able to get through some while Suzanne is presenting. But I will um, turn it over to Suzanne now, and we'll definitely try to get to all the questions that aren't answered. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, can everybody see my screen okay? Good, okay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present today. Um, I'm going to be sharing some of our findings from a recent paper that we published in Environmental Research on urban greenness and mental health among adults in the CLSA cohort. So there might be some overlapping themes with Irmina's presentation, especially regarding the exposure, so please bear with me. Oh. So I'm going to start with a causal diagram that shows green space in the context of built environments and how it can prevent chronic conditions. So there are two primary pathways from built environment to chronic conditions. So one is through behaviors that encourage or discourage us to behave in certain ways that can affect health. So this would include participation in physical activity and opportunities to increase your social interactions. The other is through exposure to harmful substances such as air pollution and extreme temperature. Now these exposures and behaviors can lead to an increase or decrease in intermediate events such as systemic inflammation and stress which then, if unaddressed, could lead to the development of chronic conditions. So I would also like to highlight that these pathways are not exhaustive and they have varying degrees of influence. The generally environment exposures tend to be very complex and interlinked. Uh, today, I will be focusing on green space and its association with various indicators of mental health. So now a little bit about mental health in Canada. Annually, we have about one in 10 Canadians who use health services to manage mood and anxiety disorders. Uh, here on the right, I have a graph showing the prevalence of mood and anxiety disorders among different age groups. Um, individuals 45 and over, carry a substantial burden of this population uh, of this disease. Additionally, we have a rapidly aging Canadian population and a large proportion of these people are reporting unmet mental health needs. Now, researchers and policymakers in the last decade have advocated for novel approaches such as improving your natural environments. Now, we have a lot of recent studies that suggest links between green space and improved health, but very few studies have focused on older adults. Additionally, we know very little about the variable impacts on economic strata, especially in the Canadian context, and how this association varies with how often people interact with their neighbourhood. So our main research question was to assess if urban greenness was associated with mental health among Canadian middle and older age adults. We also wanted to know if green space had the potential to reduce socioeconomic disparities in mental health among Canadians. So this is because we have several European studies that show pronounced benefits of greenness for those in the lower socioeconomic groups. And we wanted to know if maybe in the Canadian context, this could be true. And we also wanted to check effect modification by sex, age, household income, and how often people interact with their neighborhood. So we did a cross-section analysis of the CLSA comprehensive cohort at baseline to look at the previously mentioned questions. We restricted our sample size to the comprehensive cohort, this is because the availability of detailed data, such as frequency of interaction with neighborhood, was only available in the comprehensive cohort. So here I have a flow chart showing our final sample size 
Uh, we excluded participants who do not live in urban areas. This is because Canadian postal codes in rural areas are not spatially resolved. That means in a rural area, a postal code could cover a la large land area, such as an entire town or a village. Now to assess green space, uh, we used NDVI, the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. So very briefly, if I had to define the NDVI, these are satellite images from which we can infer the density of greenness. So Ermina had a really nice picture in one of our beginning slides of what it looks like. So the index ranges from minus one to one with negative values representing water and values around zero, bare soil, and higher positive values means dense green vegetation. So we restricted our NDVI to the positive values to isolate the effects of blue space. Now, can you compile NDVI values for Canada on an annual basis? The CLSC team assigned greenness using the centroid location of each participant's six character residential postal code. Uh, so for our analysis, we used the maximum of surrounding annual mean and DVI within a 500 meter uh, buffer of the participants place of residence. So we also conducted sensitivity analysis with 250 and 1000 meter buffers. So the CLSA had the comprehensive cohort had very rich data on various mental health uh, outcomes. We used four self-reported measures of mental health, the Center for Epidemiological uh, Studies Depression Scale. So this is the short form scale, which has 10 questions and participants answer these 10 questions and they have a score from anywhere zero to 30. Uh, then we had self-reported clinical depression. This was a yes or no question. The perception of mental health was on a Likert scale, which ranged from excellent to poor, and satisfaction of life scale was again a scale that ranged from extremely satisfied to dissatisfied. So for our analysis, we ran a multivariable logistic regression model to describe the association between greenness and mental health outcomes. And we ran a cubic spline analysis to evaluate the shape of the dose response function between greenness and CESD10 scores. So that's the depression on the continuous scale. We ran stratified analysis to evaluate the uh, variations across uh, social demographic status and frequency of interaction with neighborhood. Uh, for all of the above mentioned analysis, confounders were identified using review of literature. Then we used a distinctive cost criterion approach with a liberal value of uh, 0 0.2 to select confounders that went into the model. Here we used the relationship with the exposure. So this is our main table. Uh, we have risk estimates in three different models. The first set of estimates were minimally adjusted for age group and sex alone. Uh, this was extended to include race, household income, mobility issues, alcohol consumption, smoking status, and physical activity in model two. And the third set of estimates are the fully adjusted models that include all of the previously mentioned covariates, plus the frequency of interaction with neighborhood, region, perceived noise disturbance and NO2 concentrations. So I just want you to look at the little red boxes there. So in our fully adjusted models, we observed a 5% reduction, of reduced odds of depressive symptoms in relation to an interquartile range increase within a 500 meter buffer of the participant's residence. So we similarly found an inverse association with the other three indicators that we looked at. So self-reported uh, clinical diagnosis of depression, poor perceptions of mental health and dissatisfaction with life. So this is one of our spline graphs uh, by household income. 
So we have the CESD 10 scores on the x-axis and the maximum of annual mean and DVI within a 500 meter on the y-axis. These graphs again are adjusted for socioeconomic factors, health behaviors, and air pollution. So if we look at the less than 500, uh, 50,000 yearly household income, we see that as greenness increases, their depression scores show a steeper decrease. So for the other two groups, there is a decrease, but it's not as steep. So this is suggestive that greenness could help in reducing socioeconomic disparities in mental health. So this is a uh, second spline graph. This one is by how often people interacted with their neighborhoods. Again, these are adjusted for socioeconomic factors, health behaviors, indicators, and air pollution. So if we look at the greater than or equal to four interactions per week group and compare it to the other graph, we see that those who interacted more with their neighborhood had an overall lower score of depression. So this is suggestive that greenness, the effect of the beneficial effects of greenness tends to be stronger for people who interact more with their neighborhood. Now I want to highlight some of our strengths and limitations. So we had a large number of participants from various uh, Canadian urban areas. We were able to adjust for confounders that were not available in the past. So this includes how often people interacted with their neighborhood and perceived noise disturbance. Uh, additionally, we see consistency of findings in terms of protective association for all four of the mental health indicators that we looked at in the adjusted models and across household income categories. Now, some of the limitations that I want to highlight is a possibility of self-selection that could have happened. Um, this could have happened in two ways. So individuals of higher, higher socioeconomic status might be able to select where they want to live, so they might choose greener areas. And secondly, people with severe mental health issues might be less likely to use their neighborhoods. So both of these factors could have attenuated our odds ratios to the null. Now, because we have, we're looking at a cross-sectional nature, we data, we have limited ability to draw causal inferences. Lastly, I also want to highlight the NDVI is, uh, is a really amazing indicator, but it's unable to capture the type of vegetation, biodiversity, and if the old green space is actually accessible to you. In summary, our findings suggest that residential greenness is protective for mental health among Canadians, Canadian adults in the CLSA cohort. Now, greening uh, interventions can be used as a strategy to mitigate socioeconomic disparities in mental health. And we see stronger associations between greenness and mental health outcomes for lower SES populations and for those who frequently interact with their neighborhoods. I would like to thank all of my co-authors, especially my supervisor, Dr. Paul Villeneuve, our collaborators for providing us with such a rich, amazing data set, the CLSA team and the CANU, and our funder, the CIHR. Thank you for listening. Happy to answer any questions that you might have. Great, thank you, Susanna. And again, thank you to Ermina as well. And Ermina, you did a great job answering those uh, initial questions. Um, I'm sure there's gonna be a few more. There's always a few more that pop up, but um, I'm just gonna, I'll give uh, Susanna a little bit of a pause for a second. And I think there was one question that there was a follow-up question to um, Ermina. And that was, um, it was, uh, was greenness not associated with physical activity in females? 65 to 75 years, and, and you had said it wasn't a significant association, but um, do you have a hypothesis for why not? Oh, you're on mute. Whoops, <laughs> okay. Um, so thank you for everybody for all the questions. Um, so in terms of why it's not significant, um, I think it would come down to <laughs> the statistical analysis. Like I, I'm not sure exactly why it wasn't significant, but in terms of um, how older adults 
um, do physical activity and social activity at those ages. Um, 65 to 74 is usually considered um, after retirement for men. So uh, of that age group, um, kind of in general, um, males, I should say, they retire. So their life changes a little bit. There's, we expect to see some differences between those age groups. Um, for females in that cohort, um, it's a little bit different. Not all females of that cohort would be working. Many are, especially in the CLSA data set. Um, many would have that retirement time. But we know from other research that um, women and men, uh, like men do more physical activity, but they're also more sedentary than women at that age. So there's still more nuance to tease out from there. Um, and it definitely requires further uh, further um, investigation, I think. That's why we're we're gonna keep at it <laughs> with some of this some of this data. Okay. Great. Um, and actually I'm gonna go to a question that was asked. Maybe um, Susanna might have a comment on it. Um, it was the question from home about how greenness environment or community improves the holistic healing and wellness uh, for adults with dementia for uh, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous. I thought given the, the focus on mental mental health in your work, you might have, um, I know in the CLSA, um, I mean, it's right, the CLSA um, doesn't have specifically have a, a cohort of, of Indigenous people living on reserves, but have you come across um, differences in mental health in terms of, of uh, greenness um, for people with Alzheimer's disease, either, um, with or either indigenous or non-indigenous or sort of unpacking that all of it. So uh, in our, the paper that we did, we didn't have, we didn't look at people with memory issues or older adults. The focus was more on um, 45 to 85. So uh, like an overall, a picture of what mental health looks like when your greenness increases. But there is research out there that says as greenness increases, it increases your restorative capacity, you're able to cope more, you're able to put uh, this lesser stress. So there is some evidence out there, but it was not teased out in the paper that we did. Great. Um, and now we have a, we do have a question from Ellen, and it is, have you considered using electronic devices such as watches to track physical activity? I presume this is more one for Ermina. Uh, we would love to do that, um, but that's just not available uh, with the CLSA data set. Um, so we've used, we've actually used, uh, like we use accelerometers actually, they, um, we attach them onto our participant's uh, leg for to calculate kind of their 24 hour movement behavior. So we get a good sense of how much they are sitting and, you know, walking at a higher speed or, or um, you know, just go, getting up and down. So we would love if that was available in the CLSA. Oh, my gosh, like that's my that's my prayer. That's a question for the CLSA. Oh, you know, um, your because I'm touching. <laughs> <laughs> oh, are they going to be doing it in the next follow-up or? Yeah, actually, we've actually just, the CLSA has just recently, um, in our follow-up three, started uh, using wearable devices for some of our participants. Um, wow. So that data won't be obviously uh, ready or released for probably its early follow-up four. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, we are using mobility trackers. Um, as well as sleep trackers. And you can find some information about that, I believe, on our website. Um, look under the participant material section. I think it's under that. That'll just give you a sense of what will be uh, um, captured now. Yeah, that, that would be great because because you're right. The, whoever asked the question, like having the objective measures certainly um, adds to the subjective measure that we're collecting, like with the pace. Um, because you know, there's there's pros and cons to both, of course, but it's very helpful to have both. Um, okay, so now we have a question. Uh, do you think that greening of nursing homes will have the same effect? I don't know. Uh, um, an effect on on mental health or or uh, physical activity. Maybe you can both answer that from your own perspective. 
So, so for me, I haven't done any work in uh, long-term care, but I have done some work in assisted living and I, and I do work with an inpatient population um, in a hospital. Um, definitely any environment that is conducive to social and physical activity is going to help regardless of you know, what level of greenness it has or, or anything. Um, I actually, I, I used to actually work at a retirement home where they had courtyards that were accessible from any exit with a ramp. Like it was just so easy for people to move in and out of the building. Um, there was lots of places to rest, but also, you know, trees and plants and things that they could go outside and enjoy. And it made them want to be um, outside and maybe join a physical activity group that was taking place out there. So um, in terms of studies, that have been done in this area. I'm not very familiar with uh, for, from a long-term care perspective, but um, from my personal experience, uh, certainly having um, an outside environment is, is helpful for people who, especially with dementia. Uh, and did you have anything to follow up with, Susanna? Uh, so <laughs> enough. A, a live... Uh person or animal there or something? Yeah, so that's, I'm so sorry, that's my dog. No, um, that's okay. So for my research, we looked at, we had, so I can share a graph uh, that might show, um, so this doesn't relate to older, younger group, but so we have, we did this blind graphs for depression by 45 to 60 year old and 60, plus years old, what we saw is that the older group had an increased protective effect. You see the line is a little bit lower. So this could be suggestive that if they you have increased greenness, maybe uh, for older people, it might be even more protective than for younger people, like because you have increased opportunities for social interaction and physical participation. But I wouldn't be able to infer that to long-term care though, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so next question. Rather than overall physical activity, have you looked at different types of physical activity from the pace um, that may be more impacted by green space? Or did so this you is... already answer that one, Stephanie? Yes, you did. So oh. <laughs> let's uh let's get oh, back. Um... I think she had that was just a follow up to her first question, but what, what I wanted to just note is that we mentioned this in our, in our limitations as well is that um, for the actual um, frequency and intensity of activities, we don't, there's no, it doesn't tell us like if it's outside or inside. So that's one of the things that's kind of missing from there um, in terms of looking at physical activities that are um, listed and specific because the CLSA, the PACE does actually ask for you know, like it'll ask about golfing or soccer or other like actual activities. But again, it's not clear from that data, from those questions, whether it's inside or outside. So um, that's that's kind of a limitation that we have because people might be very physically active, but it could be all inside. So the greenness has nothing to do with how physically active they are. That's actually, um, you know, especially if you're going to a community center, which is inside, if, it, if you're in the city, but you go to the, if you go there every, every day, um, you know, the greenness has, has no impact there, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess that touches on the question um, that I was gonna note next, and which is green spaces, maybe white spaces in winter, can you tease out seasonal factors? And so as interesting, um, so if one of you wants to touch on that, that would be great. So uh, I can go first. So the NDVI, so the measure NDVI in Canada, they measure it during the summer season. Uh, so it's an average they take from when the cloud cover is less than 10%. So we only infer this when it's actually, when your vegetation is actually green. So in our analysis, we try to um, look at season. So when the month the participant answered the survey. We tried to do a sensitivity analysis with that, but none of our results changed. So eventually we didn't add that variable, but that is a factor that needs to be considered when you're doing research with greenness. Okay. Um, so maybe we'll go on to Sandra's question. What, um, which is good sort of knowledge translation research uptake question. Are you open to sharing um, your work with city planning departments and ecology centers? 
I can go first for this one. Yeah. Um, so um, my lab, I guess, um, and my supervisor for sure are, uh, we're gonna be using this information to kind of bolster some of our other uh, studies that we have going on right now. Um, currently my supervisor is uh, leading a study about um, like older adults experience of their neighborhood. So they're doing walking interviews with them, which is really cool. And we're gonna be presenting that information to um, our like regional counselors. Um, because in Osha, we have quite a strong, um, like we have the Oshawa Senior Citizen Center, which is a very big group. Um, and they're, you know, they're very motivated to make sure that older adults are getting what they need um, and that their voices are heard. So we will be using some of this information to, um, to present when we, when we end up sh uh, showing them the um, study results from our actual um, like in-person study that we've done in Oshawa. So yeah, definitely we'll be sharing that information. Great. Anything to add about uh, knowledge translation in general related to your work, Susanna? Um, so we haven't, so me, my supervisor and our team, we present when we're asked to, or within like the research team and the academic team, we haven't been able to go further than that, but that's something uh, we have been talking about, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry to put you on the spot there. Is that the no, no, that's okay. One of my favorite topics, so I, I like, uh, like making sure we address it. Um, okay, so if, uh, we have a few more questions before we wrap up. Is there a type of greenness that provides a greater impact or if personal property greenness versus public greenness have different impacts? Not sure who wants to jump in on that one. Yeah, so I can go first. So the disadvantage with NDVI is you can tell how dense the green is, but you can tell if a person has access to it, if it's your garden or what kind of vegetation it is. We don't know that yet because the NDVI is not able to capture those minute differences and those details. But there are other measures, uh, the other satellite measures that are being researched where you can actually, the AI can identify, okay, this is your personal garden, this is your park. So when we have data like that, maybe in the next few years, we will be able to tell what type of greenness actually affects your mental and physical health. The other thing that I'll add is uh, for our study, because we're using a larger buffer, we're trying to incorporate just outside of your, you know, maybe your property. Um, so if it, if we're, ideally we would have a 1000 meter buffer of the mean, um, that would be really helpful in kind of figuring out, you know, a, a kilometer um, of where you live, you know, because the idea for us, since we're considering walkability as well, um, you know, it's, it's a completely different story if you've got people who, um, like where I live um, in North Oshawa, where it's very uh, residential, m a lot of people that I know will drive up to Uxbridge to enjoy the, uh, the parks and the, um, the trails up there. So, you know, my neighborhood greenness doesn't uh, necessarily impact my physical activity outside. Um, but this would differ across age groups, of course, right? But um, for now, using a larger buffer, I think would really be the only way to um, mitigate for that. Um, and I like this question. Um, the findings on greenness and health are interesting and mostly refer to outdoor plants. Any knowledge and comments about indoor plants and health? Outside of the environmental things like air purification, um, I don't have enough uh, knowledge in that area, unfortunately. Uh, especially as it as it relates to physical activity. Um, so yeah, I would I would have to say the same because we haven't been able to make any inferences for indoor plants, and I don't think the CLSA had any questions regarding that. But maybe that's a question that could be added, like in the future. Okay, um, and so a question from Stephanie. Month was indicated as a factor investigated. Was latitude also investigated? I believe this was, would be for Amina, but... 
Um, so because of the because the CLSA um, data collection sites are like the range of latitude is pretty small because we're it's mostly from the kind of higher highest populated areas of Canada. Um, so in terms of like if you think about I don't know if you've ever if you're a gardener or if you know anything about like plant zones, most of the data collection sites are within one or two plant zones. So it's kind of it's kind of homogenous that way. Um, so we didn't account for it definitely, but absolutely, like people who live in northern Quebec will have a very different experience than those of us in southern Ontario. Okay, so last couple of questions from uh, Kathy Bacora Fuller. Um, this one is about inclusiveness. Walking and talking or listening are challenging for people with hearing or vision loss. So this night, so it might not be a great idea to interview people while walking in terms of inclusiveness. So I guess, do either of you have any comment on sort of addressing inclusiveness for people with with uh, hearing or vision loss? In, so I think I think that might be related to the comment I made about our uh, walking interviews study. Oh. Um, so for that, we um, we're we're definitely it's it's not like we're walking and talking and snapping pictures and writing it all at once. Like it's more that the participants will take us through um, their neighborhood, like where they go to the park, or you know, just to show us, oh, like you know, we don't have any sidewalk here, so I have to walk on the road, or or however they access their environment, but they're welcome to use their walkers um you know if, if they use them so far i think we've only had a few people with like canes and walkers who actually do go outside the the point is for us to um like we want them to show us what it is if if their walking interview takes the, us to the end of their driveway because they can't get anywhere that's important for us to know so um we haven't run into um that as far as I know, um, from, I'm not directly involved with the study, but as, as far as I'm aware, um, we haven't come up against that, but we, we do have a lot of variability in, um, you know, how much people are taking us for these walks. So, you know, we would be, we would try to accommodate um, any participants if they, if they wanted to be part of it, but they, you know, they can't even access their neighborhood, we would meet with them on their porch. <laughs> It's just more so that we can have their um, lived experience, like from their, um, through their own words. Okay. Um, and I think we'll have time for this one last question before we wrap up. Are there uh, also benefits of being in, benefits of being around water, such as the lake or ocean? Have either of you come across that? Maybe Susanna can- Yeah, um, so, there are there's plenty of research on blue space as well. So the beneficial effects of blue space on mental health, physical health are quite similar. So the NDVI values around zero, um, zero to a little bit over zero point one is a, tends to be blue space. So we isolated that because we had only twenty eight participants around that value. So but definitely research. Uh, around blue space is out there and they show similar protective effect for mental health. Okay, well, I think we will wrap it up now. We are right on time. Um, thank you to both of you today. I think you did a fantastic job and you had uh, lots of questions and uh, lots of really interesting questions too that hopefully challenged you as you uh, complete your PhD studies. Um, I'd like to um, remind everyone that the next deadline for data access applications, if you're interested in using the CLSA data, is July 12th of 2023. Um, you can visit the CLSA website under data access to review what data is available, as well as details about the application process. I'd also like to remind everyone to complete your survey upon exiting the, the Zoom session today. Um, for the next CLSA webinar, uh, it will be entitled The Impact of Retirement on Cognitive Decline, Findings from the CLSA, and it will be on May 23rd at 1 p.m. by PhD student Catherine Gosselin. And registration for details for uh, the next CLSA webinar will be posted on our website and social, uh, social media as well. Um, and then finally, 
Uh, a last final thank you to everyone for attending today and to our presenters. Um, and remember that the CLSA does promote the webinar series using the hashtag CLSA webinar. So we inv invite you to follow us on Twitter at, at CLSA underscore ELCV. So enjoy the rest of the day, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.